A lot of the work that the Pollution Research Group does is actually uh, trying to contribute to find solutions to on-the-ground problems actually in the Durban metro area. Um, and that's a phenomenal thing to be involved with, to actually see work that's being applied on the ground. Um, I'm going to speak to you this morning about our work on the Reinvent the Toilet project. And likewise, that work has been semi-grounded in those local conditions, and specifically in the context of community pollution blocks, um, one of which you can see in the background. I'm, I'm going to be quick fire because originally I only had about 10 minutes, um, so it's going to be a very much an overview of the project. Um, please come and talk to myself afterwards or the PI for the project, Chris Buckley or Kevin Foxton, if you want more details on what we've been doing, what we plan to do, and the results from this year. Okay, so to keep the, the context for the project in mind as we go through the presentation, um, those are the quick facts on the community evolution box in F20. Community pollution blocks typically serve around 300 users. Um, they can buy toilet facilities, showers, and often a laundry area outside as well. And the other important thing to note about them in Etiquini is that they have a caretaker to maintain the block who is paid for by the municipality. That has quite a few uh, implications if you're thinking about putting a toilet system in there that might require some some Thankfully, I don't have to go through this slide because the two previous speakers already said most of it. Um, but you must all know the aims of the RTTC challenge by now to produce a waterless hygienic toilet that processes all its waste on site and recovers the useful components from that waste uh, at, at a capital and operating cost of under 5 cent US cents per person per day. Uh, the key thing I want to pull out this slide again though is that that toilet that we produce needs to be, to the user, indistinguishable from a developed world facility. So it's got to be clean, it's got to be no smell, and eventually it's got to be something that I, as a user, would want to, to own and to pay for and to maintain. Okay. So what's our approach when at UKZN? Well, in common to all the other grantees, okay, we're process engineers, we're taking a process engineering approach. Um, a lot of our work, though, has been very much at the front end of things. So saying, okay, what design data do we need to know to produce a viable toilet system? Um, and in our case, that's meant a lot of the focus has been on, can we characterize the human excreted streams that are going into this toilet? Can we produce data that doesn't really exist at the moment, to be honest, for the process that we're trying to design? Um, we have some fantastic partners on this project, and I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and thank them for their contributions. Um, the first one is the municipality, it's Quenning Water and Sanitation, who facilitate our access to uh, toilet facilities and pop us out sampling and any other things. The second one is Envirosan, who are a pedestal manufacturer based up in Pantan. Um, they're here at the conference, and, and if, if pedestals is something that interlocks at all with your work, I encourage you to speak with them. Uh, they distribute to multiple countries across Africa. Uh, our third partner is Herring, who are a toilet facility designer. So they do quite a bit of work in Europe on sort of train station toilet blocks, things like that. And we would hopefully be working with them quite a bit more in the next phase of the project. This is an overview of our toilet system, which I'm not going to go through in detail. The important things that I want to pick out, though, is that we made a design decision up front to go for a source separation. Now, there are some great process engineering decisions reasons for doing that downstream, but it does imply some extra challenges uh, from the user interface side. So to provide as effortless user experience as a, as a conventional flushing toilet is challenging when you have a, a diverging toilet. And I know it's some discussion over that, but um, it's been found so far. So basically, out of the, I'll come back to this in a bit, but out of the toilet pedestal, we have three streams. We've got a mixed solid stream here, uh, a urine stream, and a contaminated water stream. Uh, the other things to say about this diagram is basically this side is the solids handling and over here we've got liquids handling. The energy flows within the system are basically from solid side to liquid, so we're recovering energy from the feces and non fecal solids and using that to drive the uh, liquids purification process. Our product streams are potable water and nutrient rich concentrates and the sterile nutrient rich patch. Okay, back to the source sort of separation. Um, we redesigned the pedestal to produce a three-way split, and that was very much a partnership with Envirus, and in fact, they did the majority of the work on that. The output streams are urine, uh, mixed solids, so feces, and any other solids that anyone else happens to throw down the toilet. Um, but this pedestal also gives us the facility 
responsibility to be able to rinse the pedestal with a small amount of water, but then to divert that wash water away as a separate stream rather than putting it into the solids and obviously applying extra energy for dehydration later on. So to go very quickly through how that works, we've got a um, dimensional urine diversion split there at the front, um, mixed solids drop into a solids processing module below. The different part about the pedestal, if you like, is how we're dumping the wash water. So when the lid is open, those solids are free to drop through the bottom. When the user closes the lid, a ball swings around underneath and locks onto the bottom of that pedestal uh, and catches the wash water, which is then diverted away down the pipe to a separate processing section. The nice thing is that that ball is also providing an odor seal, which is much of um, There are various other things which we can talk about on this, which we talked a lot about up there. Come back to me if you want to know more. Um, this is a wonderful slide. Okay, so source separation is a great idea uh, in theory, um, and it would be nice if it worked perfectly every time, but we know that the reality is different. Uh, some of the things to consider is that there is obvious cross-contamination, so that might be feces and urine, it might be urine and feces, we don't really know. Uh, various amounts of non-fecal solids going down the toilet. So this being Durban, I would guess that that's a KFC wrapper. There's also probably quite a bit of newspaper going down, someone's pair of pants there, and a good collection of hair extensions in the corner. Um, and this is stuff that is actually going down the toilets in the metro area. And it's just the fact of life when we have the design and system that deals with it. Some of the uh, other things to consider are in the areas we work with, there's probably going to be high prevalence of diarrhea, so the solid stream is not necessarily that solid. Uh, enemas are also pretty popular. Uh, anal cleansing in prevalent in Muslim areas, so some extra water going down the back there as well. Also to consider that the chemical composition of the excreta is not going to remain constant after it's left the body. There's obviously going to be biodegradation, urea going to ammonia, various other changes. So what's the conclusion of all this? Okay, the conclusion is we need to design a system that's robust enough to deal with the range of properties that we expect in those three streams. And to some extent, we need to find out what that range is. So a lot of our work has been precisely that. Let's go and take real samples of real excreta from real facilities and actually try and determine what those properties are. So we take various different kinds of samples. Um, we have individual donors from the university who give us their segregated feces samples. Um, we take mixed excreta samples from community and mutual blocks where we basically leave a bucket under the pedestal overnight and we look at what's caught in it, which is that delightful photo in the bottom right. And what we will be doing is taking probably the solid stream only from household urine dimension toilets so to get a mixed pool of only excreta. What are the things that we want to know about? Um, this is just an overview of the, the types of analyses that we do or are planning to do. Um, the things to say about this is, okay, the chemical properties are obviously important for the fertilizer potential at the end. The mechanical properties are what's going to tell us about how much energy we need to use in actually transferring these materials through our system, so particularly if we're thinking about extruding or pumping solids, what's the rheolog rheological kind of context that we have to deal with. And the thermal properties are, okay, how much energy can we hope to recover from the experiment and is it enough to actually power the system overall? So that's the data coming through. This is basically a massive opportunity for us to collaborate with other people on this project. We're really doing that to, to some extent with some other RTTC grantees. Um, but if in your work, you are needing real property data on human excreta, whether that's fresh or pit sludge, which Dean is going to talk about in a minute, please come and talk to us, because this is a great chance to actually produce data which people are going to use, rather than data which people are going to write papers about, which is nice to do. How long have you done? Cool. Cool. Sweet. Okay, let me talk quickly about what we're doing. Um, okay, so the first two areas I work with the pedestal developments and the excreta characterization. Let me talk quickly about what we're doing on the solids processing side. So this is the extract from the main PFD. Um, we've, we've basically got a three-stage process. So we, uh, we're, we're trying to actually dry and combust the feces and recover the energy from the combustion side. The part that we've prototyped at the moment is actually the preparation step for those solids to go into the dryer and the combustor. So we uh, are trying to get the excreter in a form where it can be efficiently dried. Um, the way we're doing that, so this is the, the prototype uh, first stage of the solids processing um, that was taken to 
to an affair. What this system is trying to do is separate the fecal solids from the non-fecal. It's trying to extrude the feces into a shape that can be efficiently dried, and it's trying to actually transfer the solids well away from the pedestal into the solids processing module. So this is a concept of how it's doing that. So your mixed solids drop down the back of the pedestal. So this is a cutaway of that to the pedestal. There. The mixed solids dropping down the back here into the RAM system. Uh, a RAM pushes those mixed solids down a pipe and shoves them up against a fixed end plate. And that causes the pasty solids to be extruded into some nice pellets um, and the non-fecal material to be compressed um, and later removed. Uh, hopefully, eventually, that system will be automated uh, with pressure that's using. Had some nice demos at the fair with whatever people were trying to throw in that hopper. Okay, there's a couple of photos of it in action. So, hopper is here, stuff's so falling in. Uh, our nice similar paste being extruded there. The, the rheological studies we're doing very much supports that the design of that extruder. Um, I'm only going to show you sort of one side of these results, and again, please come back to us if that's detailed better than you want. Um, this is just a slide showing the variation in viscosity with water content of schools um, at a fixed point shear rate, and you can see, unsurprisingly, there's a degree decrease in that viscosity. Whether that's entirely dependent on water content, or whether water content is the defining factor, or whether there are other characteristics of the feces which are coming into play, and we're unable to say definitively yet, coming out of work. Very briefly on the urine processing side, we are looking at experimental level at a three-stage process of membranes. So we're looking at microfiltration followed by nanofiltration followed by a forward osmosis system. And the reason that we're considering forward osmosis is basically the driving force for it is heat, which we can obtain from another part of our toilet system. Um, and the components of the draw solution are could be readily available for urine, so when you back up. In terms of where we go from here, um, we'll continue to do the extruder characterization work. Basically, the more data and the bigger range of it we get, the better designs we can produce. Um, and hopefully, we'll be producing data requested by other people as well. Um, we'll specifically be looking at producing design data to support the development of solids and liquids processing prototype uh, systems um, and feeding that data into a toilet system model. Um, we would also hope to work with Herring, the toilet block designer, to actually produce a purpose built community ambition block to be able to do some field testing in one of these systems. I think I'm going to move on to the slide. Awesome. Uh, yeah, acknowledge the Billum and Gates Foundation for their funding for the projects, um, our partners, EWS, Envirosan, and Herring, and specifically the staff and students of the Pollution Research Group. And I'm sorry I didn't put their names on here particularly to Vincent Ndu, to Stuart Willey, and to Donald Horseman, because these guys are actually the ones who are handling the real shit day to day and getting their hands dirty and doing a great job of it. So, big thank you to them. Thanks a lot for listening.